thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the association for having me, uh, in, invited me to this great conference. So in my talk, I would like to outline a bit the different soft tissue procedure and contrast them against the bone block procedure. It connects a bit with the previous talk, and I would like to show you a bit the literature behind it. In the end of the talk, I would also like to compare the, the bone block, the different bone block procedures. So um, I think the main challenge in anterior shoulder instability is the fact that it's triggered by multiple different lesions within the soft tissues and the bony structures that stabilize the granular joint. And these lesions occur in a broad spectrum of different patients. So depending on the gender, age, activity, hypolaxy and sports activity of the patient, each patient might, might have different recurrence rate following a stabilization procedure. Moreover, I think the current literature shows that uh, bony structures are the most relevant stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint. In this study by Shin, they actually exposed the glenohumeral joint to uh, low loads of 20 to, 19 new 20 to 30 newtons in the anterior inferior direction. And what they saw is that with an isolated banker lesion, they could not observe any increase of the translations or no significant increase. That would only happen if you have a small bony lesion already at 10%, 10-50% of granny bone loss, you can observe the increase of anterior inferior translation. So that means that isolated soft tissue lesions might be compensated by the glenohumeral joint, but as soon as you have a small lesion at the glenoid, then you have a significant increase of instability. And moreover, I think there's this theory out that with each dislocation, we stretch out the inferior capsule, the inferior glenohumeral ligament that stabilizes our shoulder like a hammock. And so with each dislocation, the hammock gets more and more incompetent and thus insufficient probably to stabilize the shoulder when we do an isolated soft tissue procedure. So all in all, we must ask ourselves, probably the banker is not the ideal procedure to provide long-term stability in, all, in patients with soft tissue lesions. Probably we have to expand the bone, uh, bony procedures and also apply them in patients who might not really have a big lesion within the bone. And when you look at this, this study that's from a Swiss institution, the Bulgars Group in Switzerland, then you might think, okay, I think we need to expand the bone block procedures and anterior shoulder instability. So what they did in this study, they compared a cohort of 271 patients who underwent the arthroscopic banquet repair with 93 patients who underwent the ladder shape procedure for anterior shoulder instability. And the patients in the Lattice group, they were more prone to redislocation recurrences because they had more bony deficiency. They also had a better, uh, a worse uh, fu um, function, shoulder function at baseline. And when you now uh, look at the long-term results, up to 10 years, you see that the banquet group had a significantly increased uh, redislocation, reoperation, and uh, events of any instability as compared to the ladder shape group. And what was striking is that in the bank group, you can have late recurrences even up to 10 years, you have redislocation. And that would not observe, uh, could not be observed in the ladder shape group. So when a ladder shape was stable over, the, over two years, it also remained stable in long term. So, okay, so probably ladder shape is a solution to everything? Probably not, because we also have to see the other side of the coin. It's not only about redislocation. Um, so this um, study here, or systematic review by brilliance appealed to us that you should also look at complications. And when you now sum up the literature, you can see that the arthroscopic and bony back of procedures have overall a five to ten times higher um, complication rate as compared to the bank, just if you look at the literature we have problem of uh, hardware and uh, non-union of the graft, etc. And we all know from our personal experience that if the Lodergé is done in the correct way, it's a very successful procedure, but when you have complications, then it's not so easy to revise. And this was a case, I performed the Lodergé uh, for a failed banker, and 
then he was very happy and stable, and then he re-dislocated the old graft in a car accident, and now the graft is broken, as you can imagine, that this situation was not so nice to revive. And this is also shown in the literature, so he too revived a lavender shape with an intubinate procedure, as we have seen before, the outcomes were not so favorable, so you can have a re-dislocation rate up to 80 and uh, up to 30% of patients can have persistent apprehension. Whereas when you revise or fail back into the latter shape, the outcomes are more or less the same as if you did in a primary procedure, so more or less like a primary latter shape procedure. So we have to think twice, I think. So the back can have a different role in the treatment of anterior shoulder disability, but I think the key uh, is to select the ideal patient. And there we have to look at the literature that uh, shows us what are our, the risk factors of recurrence and failure. And I think we all know that there's a certain age limit for the back. So uh, a patient under the age of 20 years is with higher redislocation rate as compared to older patients. It's not, not only shown in the well known study by Follow, but as you can see here in the overall six studies. Age limit is worse, so and probably it's due to the fact that in the young patients are those who have much more of an activity in the left hand lead to a dislocation. Likewise, uh, male patients have a higher redislocation of their back uh, than higher redislocation rate of their lateral back than the female patients. Um, overhead competitive sport is a well known risk factor. It has also been evaluated in two studies, but if you compile the evidence, Contact sports is a parameter within the ISDS score, we all know. And however, if you compile the evidence, it's not so clear. The differences are not really significant. But I think still, I would say, uh, to do an uh, arthroscopic back in a rugby player like here on the top left, probably it's uh, not a, such a good idea, I would say, while it's productive. And hyperlaxity is also a well known risk factor. You just have to aware that you how you should measure hypolaxy because only for the Gaget test it has been shown in the literature that this is a predictor of uh, failure so if you have a positive Gaget test then um, then you have a high chance of recurrence after a banquet as you can see it has only been evaluated in two studies and there are other signs for hypolaxy like the sulcus sign drops and so on these tests have not been evaluated as a risk factor for a failed bank. And the number of previous dislocation in the previous talk it was uh, alluded to, so um, there's good evidence around it. So the first study on the left is here from Andreas Simhoff, you all know. So he could show that patients with an isolated dislocation and persistent instability had a significantly lower recurrence rate in after a bank repair as compared to patients who had two or three uh, dislocations prior to procedure. And there's a bit older study that evaluated patients after an open bank repair could also show that there was significant uh, linear increase in recurrence rate in line with the number of uh, preoperative dislocations after a bank cut. So the bony defect, I think, is the most relevant uh, risk factor. We heard about it. Now the question is only what kind of bony defect can we still accept or what, what extent of bony defect can we still extend, accept for a back repair? When we ask orthopedic surgeons, they usually reply, well, it's 20%. So this number comes from the biomechanical study uh, from E2A published in 2000. But uh, so far, there have not been many, many studies that have looked at these numbers in real patients. And the, most studies did also not use very good measurements of the proclenoid defect. There's only this study here by Shin. We used 3D CT scan, which should be nowadays standard. And they could show that if you have a bony defect of 17.3%, and this is a really a very strong predictor of failure of the banker with a sensitivity of about 75%, and there's even a severe weakness uh, the engaging heel sacs lesion, so the off track lesion, we heard about it. I think that with this concept of the granular track, we can now really assess if uh, 
because acceleration is relevant. So in abduction and external rotation, we have a very tiny area of contact between the femoral head and the glenoid. And whenever the, um, the lesion is medial to this track, um, it's uh, engaged in this acceleration. And this is also very important to realize because you can see here now the recurrence rate um, on the, the bottom line is the one which just engaged in this acceleration after you have a after an arthroscopic bank cut already, if you're about 25 years of age and you have an isolated engagement in this acceleration, your recurrence rate is about 30%, and that can even go up to about 50 to 60 if you have uh, bony defect of up to 24%. So, this uh, results here are taken from a study by Ochner. So, everything is combined in the ISES score, you all know. Um, and the question again here is what is uh, the appropriate limit of the ICS score? So it was initially suggested that it should be about six points. Then on the bottom left, you see uh, here a study that uh, identified the four, limit, four points as a limit. I think the pendulum will swing back and forth, and we have to be aware that the ICS score is just something we can apply in daily life. We can assess the situation quickly just by plain radiographs, but in the end, it's still a very, very, um, uh, let's say, um, patient-specific decision we have to take. So, we address uh, bone loss at the humeral site. We know that we can do the technique, and then we can externalize an ex uh, uh, engaging hill sacs lesion. At the, um, or we can uh, do a laparoscopy. At the glenoid uh, surface, we can convert um, uh, an on off track lesion into an on track lesion. And so, what is the best uh, procedure here? So, if you have uh, bone loss of up about 10% at the glenoid, by both strategies might work. So, you see here this study that compared 30, uh, 37 patients undergoing a ramp visage. The 35 undergoing a latter shape procedure, both groups had mild bony deficiency, and you see the, the outcomes at two to three years that there was no significant difference. So at the glenoid uh, side, we know we can do, as we have heard before, we can do a latter shape or a bone block to augment the glenoid surface. And with the latter shape has the advantage that it has a sling effect, so there's a sort of tissue procedure somehow associated. And um, there are not many good studies out there comparing the two, the two procedures. Um, there's one uh, well-known study by Philip Morot, who's also a, a member of our society, and he compared the latter shape with the J-SPAN, which was um, developed by Professor Esch as a bone block procedure. And this was a randomized study with a follow-up of up to two years. And what you can see is that um, subjective stability and function were no significant difference in between the two groups after two years. Now you may say, okay, two years is a bit short because we know in the banker we have to follow the patients up to 10 years. But for the bone block procedures, we have seen before that uh, most recurrences occur within two years, so probably this is really uh, for this kind of procedure a sufficient follow-up and um, is uh, relevant to us. And you look at the uh, functional outcome, we, uh, Philip could see that, uh, that the Vatage group had a significantly decreased internal rotation, so rotation-wise the bone block was a bit better, and uh, the J-SPAN could also better reconstruct the glenoid defect. So um, when you have a large glenoid defect, probably the bone block is the better option because with the latter J, you can, in a 25% glenoid deficiency, you can only reconstruct about 95% of the glenoid surface, whereas with the bone block, you can completely reconstruct it. And if you look at complications, the latter J and the J span procedure were more or less the same. Um, you see in the latter J sometimes patients with scapular dyskinesia. You don't see that in the, or rarely see that in the bone block procedure. However, in bone blocks, you have to be the problem of the donor site morbidity. Just now to sum up, I think um, the 
bank repair is still a good procedure and your shoulder instability. It has a higher rate of recurrent instability, but in selected patients it might still work. It has fewer complications. We should limit and uh, respect the limits of the procedure. So anyway, bone loss probably 70%, probably also a bit less. Hypolaxia of, of tracheal axis problem. And for me, in a young male, even with mild bone loss, I would go for a ladder shape. And the bone block procedures we have seen, there are not significant differences really out there. Probably we can better reconstruct the cladding surface with the bone block as compared to the ladder shape. So nowadays, I would say it's still it's equivalent. Both are. I thank you for your attention.